Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. After the disappointing failure of the Peregrine mission, NASA's first efforts to try to scout out the surface of the moon, the last thing we needed was more bad news about Artemis. But yesterday, that is precisely what we got. Not only disappointing in terms of estimated dates for the execution of Artemis II, but also completely unrealistic dates for Artemis III. Is NASA feeding the public a line of propaganda, or are they really this clueless? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. So, we recently got an update from NASA about the state of Artemis, got some new dates for Artemis 2 and Artemis 3, and if you are easily triggered, well, I recommend that you click off of this video right now, because I'm going to be getting pretty damn mean through the course of this video. I am very disappointed with the update that we got from NASA yesterday and the way that the information was conveyed. Let me try to explain. NASA is in a position right now, as we all know, where they are trying to get us back to the moon, this time to stay for the first time in over half a century. And we are facing incredible challenges in the process. The choices that NASA has made for trying to get back to the moon have complicated the process significantly. And I've talked about this many times, even though I believe that Starship and to a lesser degree Blue Moon may be a really good solution for the long term on the moon simply because they're capable of delivering a lot more people and a lot more cargo to the lunar surface than other solutions. It's going to be a very difficult process to try to get these solutions to the point to where they can put people on the moon anytime soon. But that's not what was conveyed to us. Instead, we were given a new date for Artemis II. That, in my opinion, was a realistic date, and that is September of 2025, which is, again, very disappointing, although realistic, as I just said, but disappointing after such an amazing performance from the Artemis I mission that we would have to wait this long just to have a mission that's going to circumnavigate the moon, and that's it. However, the date they gave for Artemis III is complete nonsense, and the way that they defended that date, the level of arrogance that I detected when they were queried as to just how realistic the date was. Well, that got me even more irritated. Now, what the hell am I talking about? I mean, isn't NASA better qualified to give an estimate as to when they're going to be able to put human beings back on the moon than I am? Don't they know a lot more about this than I do? Well, absolutely they do. And it is for that reason that I am so aggravated because they should know that September of 2026, yes, that's the date they're giving as to when we are going to be landing human beings on the moon again for the first time in over half a century, they should know that that date is completely unattainable. Four stage engine start. Three, two, one. Boosters in ignition. And liftoff of Artemis One. It's kind of hard to believe that over a year has passed since this momentous occasion, this amazing liftoff of the SLS for all the negative things that I've said about this rocket. Man, this was an impressive moment and an impressive debut from the Artemis SLS system. That being the case, though, we definitely thought that we would be getting an Artemis II mission, given the fact that it was going to be making use of pretty much all the same equipment with no landing on the lunar surface, four astronauts circumnavigating the moon, and that's it. It seemed pretty much a done deal to get astronauts to the moon on Artemis II, 
sometime in the near future, perhaps no longer than a year, maybe a year and a half, something like that. And yet, the end of 2024 is what we were told to begin with, which seemed like an unreasonably long period of time given the fact that none of the equipment was really changing, and yet now we've been told September of 2025. Crew safety is the main reason. According to Jim Free, this is what he had to say, by the way, right before he stepped down as the head of this program, quote, I want to emphasize that safety is our number one priority. You heard it from the administrator today, you've heard it multiple times. And as we prepare to send our friends and colleagues on this mission, we're committed to launching as safely as possible, and we will launch when we're ready. We've heard this over and over again. We will launch when we're ready. Now look, I respect this. NASA has to do this as safely as possible. However, in my opinion, after losing two shuttle crews, NASA has started to become a bit timid. And if we had had this kind of attitude back in the 1960s, we would have lost the race to the moon to the USSR. And incidentally, we are now racing against a country that has a similar amount of disregard for the safety of their astronauts, or Taikonauts, shall we say, the Chinese. The Chinese, of course, I'm not saying that they don't care at all about their people, but they are more than willing, in my opinion, to sacrifice people in order to make it to the moon before we do and establish a presence and a state of ownership at the South Pole before NASA can achieve this. And they keep advancing their estimated landing dates because they are really going for it. Whereas at the same time, NASA continues to delay their estimated arrival time and the lead that NASA currently enjoys over the People's Republic of China becomes more and more narrow all the time. So what is Artemis II, by the way? What exactly is NASA trying to achieve with that mission? Well, mostly this is just a test for the life support system on the Orion capsule. That's pretty much it. They're going to have a crew of four astronauts on board, including the first woman to ever go to the moon, Christina Koch, the first person of color to ever go to the moon, and that is Victor Glover, and the first Canadian to go to the moon, Jerry Jeremy Hansen. However, all they will do is make their way to the moon orbit once, at least that's the current mission parameters. The orbit will actually take them further away from Earth than astronauts have ever gone in the past because they're not going to a low lunar orbit the way the Apollo astronauts did, but a higher orbit instead, and then the capsule will simply return to Earth and then the heat shield will be called upon to protect the astronauts when they re-enter the atmosphere, splashing them down, hopefully, safely in the Pacific Ocean. Not a whole lot different than Apollo in that regard. However, here is the big problem. Number one, the heat shield did not perform as perfectly as NASA originally thought. Some of the heat shield actually ablated away came disconnected or liberated, as they said, from the rest of the heat shield. And perhaps more concernedly, some problems were detected with the capsule's abort system, which of course didn't have to be used because the SLS rocket performed perfectly, but nevertheless, those kinds of problems definitely need to be addressed in order to protect the safety of the astronauts. I understand all of this, and although I am disappointed about the delay, it does does make sense that NASA needs to rectify these issues before we can realistically move forward. The things that I had the bigger problem with is the estimated September of 2026 date for putting humans on the surface of the moon. This is completely unrealistic, and nobody who knows anything about this industry and about what is going to be necessary to get us to the moon should really think that this date can be achieved. Let me try to explain why. First of all, if it's going to take us until September of 2025 to fix the problems with Orion, which is a fully mature, human-rated system, what makes us think that all of the issues 
with Lunar Starship are going to be rectified only a year later. The level of complexity involved with Lunar Starship makes Orion look like a tinker toy by comparison. First of all, Starship has yet to get to orbit, and SpaceX hasn't even tried to reuse the booster yet, to even capture it, let alone use it twice. Reusability is going to be an absolute essential if Starship is going to successfully get humans to the surface of the moon. If we lose booster after booster, 33 engines after 33 engines after every launch attempt, the cost of the Starship solution is going to absolutely skyrocket far beyond the $4 billion or so that NASA has allotted to SpaceX thus far for this rocket. Reusability is an absolute essential, and Elon Musk has said as much. On top of that, we have low Earth orbit refueling, which hasn't been attempted yet. I mean, we're not even close to attempting it. And since we're talking about low Earth refueling, let me go ahead and talk about one of the biggest things that pissed me off in yesterday's conference call. And that was the question that was put to the SpaceX representative as to how many refueling missions are really going to be required in order to get enough propellant and oxidizer into Lunar Starship to execute a successful mission. At first, the SpaceX representative dodged the question Question. She talked about the amazing launch cadence of the Falcon 9 and somehow tried to connect that launch cadence to what was going to be possible with Starship. Okay, maybe, but that's not going to happen right away. It took years to get Falcon 9 up to the level of excellence that it currently enjoys, and we can expect a similar development time with the biggest rocket in human history, especially when we're trying to reuse such a colossal booster. But on top of that, she also tried to compare the art of refueling in low Earth orbit with docking Crew Dragon to the ISS. Okay, maybe they're good at docking a tiny capsule to a space station, but that's a lot different than trying to dock two colossal starships, or rather one colossal starship and one colossal fuel depot with one another. And then, of course, the whole refueling process in microgravity, that's going to be a unique challenge unto itself. And that she talked as if we were almost there already, that the entire process had already been developed, and then she didn't say how many launches were going to be required. Then Bill Nelson got a bit irritated, you could hear it in his voice, and he demanded that the SpaceX rep answer the question. And finally she did, saying that roughly 10 or so launches would be required. And man, she didn't sound confident about that number at all, indicating to me that I don't think SpaceX really knows how many launches are actually going to be required. But let's go ahead and say that it's only 10, okay? So we're talking about getting Starship up to a point to where it's fully reusable. Then we have to master low Earth orbit refueling. Then we're going to have to launch Starship 10 times, assuming, of course, that the launch of Lunar Starship itself is included in that 10 figure. Let's assume that it is. 10 launches of the biggest rocket in human history. The FAA will need to approve all 10 of those launches. And that is just to set down an unmanned Lunar Starship on the surface of the moon. Just to execute a test and then 10 more launches of the biggest rocket in human history, and the FAA will need to approve all of that, and that's assuming that the test mission goes absolutely perfectly, that NASA has no problems whatsoever with this brand new human-rated system and is prepared to just let them go for it right away after they test it. <laughs> Does that seem very likely to you? So 20 launches of the biggest rocket in the world, plus all the development time to get it to that point. And again, keep in mind, Starship has not yet passed its preliminary design review yet. Yeah, that's going to be happening real soon, but it hasn't happened yet. All of that in two years and nine months. Given the amount of time it's taken to get Starship to the point that it's at right now, I am telling you with 
absolute confidence that that is not going to happen. And another reporter asked about this. They said that according to people in the industry that they had talked to, this was just an aspirational date this September of 2026, that there was no realistic way that NASA was actually going to achieve that. And was NASA really serious about this date? Well, the NASA representative who chose to answer the question, by the way, I should be using their names at this point, but it doesn't really matter because none of these people are going to be working in this department by the time these launches actually happen, given how quick the turnover has been in Artemis thus far. But anyway, getting back to his response, oh, that's kind of funny because the industry experts that we have contracted right now are telling us with absolute confidence that this these dates are achievable. Okay, NASA guy, let me acquaint you with one of your biggest contractors, your biggest industry expert, the one that matters the most, Elon Musk. Since you don't seem to know a whole lot about the guy, let me tell you a little bit about him. The dates that he gives you are not accurate at all you need to add at least 12 to 24 months onto whatever date he tells you because that is Elon time. I'm rather surprised that you've never heard of Elon time, but that's what you're dealing with here. If he tells you September of 2026, it's more than likely September of 2028, which incidentally is roughly the time that NASA was looking at going back to the moon before Jim Bridenstine, remember him, started talking about 2024, which obviously now was never an achievable date. And that, by the way, was the initial date that Elon Musk gave to NASA in terms of when he thought Lunar Star ship could actually put people on the moon. At this point, he's going to be lucky to get to orbit in 2024, to have an operational ship that's capable of carrying cargoes up to orbit in 2024, let alone an interplanetary ship. Now, once again, I want to be clear. I'm not slamming Starship as a system. I really think Starship is the future of our exploration and colonization of the solar system. It's a very good good idea for the long term, but in terms of trying to get us to the moon as rapidly as possible, it just isn't. There's just too much involved with this system to get us to the moon in any kind of realistic time frame. Now, 2028, well, I hope that's achievable. Keep in mind, that's only a little over four years away from now, but I think that perhaps Starship will be ready to carry things out by then. But then again, it's hard to say for certain. So, what comes next? Well, we're gonna see. Once again, I feel pretty confident about the September 2025 date for Artemis 2, but I think it's only a matter of time before we get another one of these updates from NASA and Artemis 3 gets pushed out yet again. I'll keep all of you informed. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you, Sam Sayer and Digital Historian for becoming my latest Patreon supporters. I really appreciate your help. It makes all the difference in the world and my ability to bring content to you and my ability to go back to the States to cover the upcoming OFT3 launch for Starship. And thanks very much to the rest of you. Please like, please subscribe. It's very important to the success of my channel. And as always, stay angry about space.